Richard, how are you doing? How are you doing, Father? I'm, I'm great, man. It's, it's been a while since I last saw you. I think it was 2019? 2019. Yeah. It's, it's ZITF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How have you been? I've been doing great. I've been it's doing been, great, yeah. For the people who might not know who you are, um, you are founder. Is founder the fair term? Founder yes. of Billest24. Yeah, I'm the founder of Billest24 and also the director of the organization. Yeah. So, what is uh, Billest24? Okay, uh, so Billest24 is a community uh, community dissemination platform. You yeah. can just call it a community news, newsletter. Uh, we focus on uh, disseminating information to young people in the community. Uh, we also focus on trying to bridge the information gap between uh, the service providers, the, the government offices, and the people that they serve, the community that they serve. We try to find that information when we give it to the community in languages that they can understand. Okay, and when did you start uh, this community newsletter? Uh, the community newsletter started uh, around December 20, 2018 yeah. and we had our first uh, newsletter in February 2019 and ever since we've been uh, on the job. And so you, it's a community newsletter. Uh, yes. I think anyone would be wondering which community are you guys serving? Okay, uh, so initially we, we started to save, we started this organization to, to save Mbari. Yeah. Yes, because most of the people that are working in Village 24, they are from Bari. But uh, then with the need from other communities to save as well, we migrated and we now serve in, uh, in uh, Opley, uh, uh, Epworth, Edcliffe. Yeah, those are some of the communities that we are. Mm, that's to. interesting. That's interesting because when I met you in 2019, you were still only uh, serving by. So it's yes. good to see that you guys have have grown. And at that time, you were referring to it as as an e paper. Yes. Um, so when you started off, how were you distributing uh, this newsletter? How was it getting to the people? Okay, so we realized that uh, we we not get it through a way that we can try to disseminate our our information to the yeah. people. So we then realized that uh, most of the people that in the community that we want to save, uh, they do not afford, like, uh, let's say, to buy a newspaper or to buy data bundles to go on Facebook and find information or connect to our website. So we, re well, we realized that, but most of them, they have my smartphones. So we decided to use uh, WhatsApp as a primary mode of communication because we realized that young people can, can be on WhatsApp every day. So we decided to, to create an e-paper and we distributed it uh, on WhatsApp. We compressed it to probably 700, 700 KB way by people can just yeah. afford to use their own data yeah, to download. And at this moment, uh, how many people were you, were you reaching uh, via WhatsApp? Uh, at that time, we had... Uh, we're over around uh, 50 groups, uh, 50 groups with yeah. each group with about 230 people, 230 to 250 people. Yeah. So we're distributing our newsletter and yeah, we we'll, would we'll, we'll measure our, our impact through that. Okay, okay, that's interesting, that's interesting. And because when I last spoke to you, that's when you were distributing uh, via WhatsApp and at that time it was still just WhatsApp alone. Uh, yes. Since then, uh, what have you have you expanded your distribution methods? Uh, we're still we're still doing WhatsApp, mostly, but uh, we also now have an email list where we send to people who have requested uh, to have us send them via the email, mm -hmm. and we're so also still trying to put it on Google so that people can just download it straight from from Google Drive and everything else. Mm -hmm. What is what is the biggest challenge you faced uh, since you started in Billes Twenty Four? Because naturally, um, like you said, there's a huge information gap. Yes. Uh, one of the other things you mentioned was that uh, people can't really afford data or newspapers and stuff like that. So, what are the challenges you faced as a group trying to actually get this information to to people? Okay. The the first challenge. Uh, 
was in getting the, the duty bearers, the public offices that we were targeting to give us information so that we can send it to the young people. Yeah. So it was the challenge to make them believe that we are just young people from the community who just want other young people to have information. Yeah. So it was a bit <laughs> of a challenge for them to give us the information that we needed to send to the young people out there. So that was one, one, one of the bigger challenge. Yeah. But then also the other was expertise. Like uh, most of the people that, were, that we were with at that time, they were still undergraduates. Most of them, others were just young people who were just interested in sending information. So we didn't have like the expertise that's, that was needed to, to push this thing through. Yeah. And also, obviously, the issue of, of funds, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, Big it, issue. It, it, it goes to everyone else. But we, we did look at it as a challenge. We just saw it probably as a, we didn't see it as a barrier, in fact. We just wanted to, we were very lucky that we had young people who just wanted to do this thing for the community. So we didn't worry about money. So it was just a case of uh, if something is needed, like let's say you want to photocopy a paper, people yeah. just volunteer, say, I have the money, you know, I have yes. the funds, I have the bond paper, I have a printer, and people will provide. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, I'm going to ask you about these challenges in depth. So initially what you said was it was very hard for you to convince the people who held the information yes. that you wanted to put it uh, to good use. How did you then manage to do it? How did they give you access to that information? Uh, we're still trying to get that information. <laughs> it's still a challenge. <laughs> yeah, we're still, we're still trying to get that information. We haven't reached the point whereby we say we're yeah. comfortable. Yeah, but yeah, there are some, some, some instances where you get called by, let's say, like the councillor, uh, the yeah. MP from the community, and they say, ah, I have information on what is happening. You have people from the health sector, from the youth economic, uh, Zimbabwe, probably Zimbabwe Youth Council, they will just give us information, this is what is happening. Yeah. Do you want to share it with the community? Say, give us the information and, and we share it. But we feel they still need to get more information. There is still a lot of players, public, main public offices, yeah. that can give us more information which can be very uh, encouraging to other young people. Yeah, and so is it a case of them refusing to give you the information? Like how does that go? Let's say you you go to a public player and you want access to this information. How does that usually go where you then walk away without getting what you need? Uh, I think it's, a, it's an issue of bureaucracy and uh, policies yeah. whereby you don't just give anyone information <laughs> in your office because my you at that time uh like we we're just young people undergraduates yes they were media practitioners but they did not have their accreditations so it was a oh, case so of there was no trust yeah so probably it was the issue of trust you just you just come into our office and you're saying you're young people you want to get not information <laughs> so i think it was an issue of policy that was uh, preventing them from giving us the information. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. And then when you speak of funds, um, you've, you've talked about people volunteering, uh, people volunteering to do work, people volunteering with resources. Yes. Um, but surely uh, there must be some sort of uh, funding to, 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 to power your, your work. Or at least I would assume there is. In terms of business models, uh, what have you guys uh, tried so far as, as a media company? Uh, so what we have tried is we have tried to put uh, to put ads in our in our newsletters, yeah. advertising, creating an ad, ad, advertising platform for for yeah for people doing different businesses. Yeah. So we have responded, but uh, like the the revenue generation is still not enough. Yeah. So now we we have a website that we are using. And we are also in the process to try and uh, monetize it as well so that we can be able to raise more funds for the for the organization yeah so i remember when we spoke in 2019 uh, one of the things you were really excited about uh, in regards to advertising you you felt that there was a huge opportunity because of the the industry uh, within yes. Mbari, and then uh, your paper uh, meeting the community. Uh, from your experiments there, do you think 
because from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like you are not as confident about advertising as you were back then. Uh, where do you think maybe uh, that fell apart if it did? Uh, not, not, not to say that it, it failed. Yeah. <laughs> but like uh, over the years, like since we last spoke, yeah. Uh, I, I have to admit, like there have been some inconsistencies in the in the organization. So there, there, there will be times where we'll be ad, like approached by people actually wanting to put advertisements on a on the on the paper. Yeah. But we've been uh, like failing to to strategically put uh, uh, specific uh, tools like prizes and everything, ratings and everything for yeah. for, for for the advertising. So. Th this was one of the challenges. Like I, like I said, we were young people who were with <laughs> zero experience on what we were trying to do. Yeah. Uh, but we, we, what, 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 what we just wanted was to give like the information to other young people. So the experience that we didn't have at that time was not adding up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I suppose it's, it's getting better now, isn't it, uh, that you uh been at it for for longer now yes so i uh, like now i have to admit uh we've been receiving a lot of capacity strengthening from uh from other organizations that have been seeing us and uh, yeah. appreciating the work that we've been doing one of uh, the organizations is uh, like plan international they've been uh, helping us a lot uh through capacity strengthening like media and everything, finance, how to mobilize resources and everything. So we're still getting that capacitation, but we we hope that the, by the time we we say we're finished, of course we're we're not gonna finish receiving capacitation. <laughs> yeah, but it's an ongoing we, process. Yes, we we hope that uh, in a in a few months time or probably a year we'll be capacitated yeah, enough to be able to make village twenty four self-sustainable yeah and so one of the things that interests me is uh when we spoke in 2019 we didn't particularly speak about uh your your team because that was like a very rushed podcast i remember we were yes. the ITF was closing and we just didn't have the time but uh in terms of um the team the skill side of thing things uh how much have you grown since then like maybe if, if you're in a position to uh, share how many people do you now have working uh, under Mbilas 24 and what was it like then? So it's like uh, like the team that we started with Mbilas 24, yeah. uh, that was about around 11 young people. Yeah. It's still there. The 11 young people that we started with, we are, we are still together. But uh, over the years, we've, we've uh, had other young people coming uh, participating and uh, becoming members. So there was a time when we had uh, like the people who worked directly in the office, there were about 25. Yeah. But the work wasn't going, or well, was not moving as we would uh, expected, like with more people. Added those then, numbers. Yes. So we decided to stream again and we said, let's go back to where we started. And we, go, we went back to the 11. The initial people. 11. Yes. But uh, we still have other young people who contribute. To, yeah. with stories like like I was saying we have young people in Edcliffe, in Epworth, Stone Ridge, Popley who provide information uh, and who also put it on newspaper but they are not they are not permanent members but they're just members who just provide information whenever they see something which is uh, relevant to share in their communities. Yeah. So how does it happen that you uh, you add you almost double the numbers of the workforce? Yes. Um, but the output, as you say, uh, isn't what you expect. Maybe what was going on there, like how how does how does it add up? I think it was an issue, like our older members were saying, and now we now have new members. New members can go and they can take the stories. So they were just say a backsliding. <laughs> and just say, ah, we, people relaxed. Yeah, people relaxed. <laughs> saying we've been doing this for a long time. Let the new guys do the the work now. Yeah. Like like I was saying, everyone is a volunteer when it comes to Miller Twenty Four. So when the new volunteers came, the older volunteers they decided to take it back to, to 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 give room for the new members. So the new members also felt like they also needed their older members 
like our capacity strengthening yeah. and also as well to show us how it's done. How you guys were doing it before. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> it makes sense to me. And then on a on a personal level, um you started uh Bill S24 and I remember when we spoke in, in, in twenty nineteen uh, one of the things we were talking about was how hard it is uh, to start something in a place that seems almost so hopeless. Uh, like the narrative of 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 Barry hasn't yes. uh, hasn't always been a great one. Like uh, the way it's viewed, it's all it's almost viewed as if only negative things can come out of your community. Yes, which I'm sure uh, is not true. It can't be true that a place is only negative. Uh, why did you start the platform and and what keeps you going because like you said uh, you started in late 2018 it's yes. almost late 2022 you've been going for four years now so why did you start and what keeps you going okay so the, the one of the reasons i think this one was the major reason why we started uh when you go on a platform like google and you google mbare yeah uh the issue that you're gonna see are the dilapidated <laughs> flats yeah uh the overcrowding at bottom seeker all the negativity about body when you talk about drugs issues and everything you those are the conversations that you get to see first all right so we, we we're arguing that uh we have a lot of good in body but this good is being uh overlooked because of the bad situation that the community currently is so yeah. what we wanted was to to share the positive side of body the good things that are coming out of Mbari. For example, the chill sport, the Zim Danzo yeah. movement, which is coming out of Mbari. We all wanted to show the, the contemporary arts that are Mbari, visuals and everything. So these are some of the issues that we wanted. We wanted also to flag the internet with the good things about Mbari. So that the next time when you go on Google and you Google Mbari, uh, you'd see a different perspective about Mbari. Yeah. So that, that that is how we wanted to to yeah to, to frame your yeah. your story and so maybe lastly before we end um <clears throat> what do you feel have been uh the successes of Miles 24 since you since you started and yeah let's let's start with that uh like one of our of one, one of our goals was to to bridge the information gap and we it's a like i said it's, it's more like advocacy. It's a process. You don't. You cannot measure like impact and results from from the moment you go into the field. Yeah. But like I was saying, we have managed to get like to create relationships with the duty bearers, and now they trust us with information in the community. Uh, we've managed to to have uh, partnerships with other civil society organizations. Yeah. They they come to us and they. They, they, they encourage they give us information to share uh, with organizations like uh, like I was saying Plan International Zesni also managed to work with the uh, organization like uh, UNTP they also partly capacitated us in 2021 during COVID-19 yeah uh, so these are some of uh, the things that gives us a lot of information because the more organizations and the more duty bearers we engage with the more access to information that we're going to have as an organization. So these are some of uh, the great successes that we have managed to have as an organization. And also indirectly, not, yes. not us as Mbilis24, but we've managed to influence a lot of uh, young people from the community to just create pages on Facebook or whatever, Twitter, and start to share the good things that are happening in Bari. Yeah. Yeah, so we have other groups which have even exceeded uh, the Mbilis24 platform, but uh, like, like, like we are saying, like there were these groups were formed after Mbilis24, but the energy that young people now have uh, around uh, around Mbare is overwhelming. So yeah. this is one of our, the great successes of what we have done as an organization. Yeah, yeah, it's always it's always good uh, catching up uh, with you. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I I like what you guys are doing. Uh, I've liked it since uh, the first day, and so. Maybe the last thing I would, I would then ask you is, in your in your view, yes. uh, where do you see Mbilis24 being maybe five years from now, ten years from now? Uh, uh, <laughs> if you had asked me that question, in, uh, like back then at uh, yeah. ZITF, 
I'll probably tell you that uh, Billy H24 will be like the next year out, the next daily news. Yeah. And uh, and, I'll, and, and I'll pride on that. But like over the years since we last spoke, yeah. uh, we've kind of like migrated from just providing information to young people, but also trying to advocate for the social social challenges that we've been identifying in the community. Yeah. That's why we've been man we've been able to attract a lot of NGOs because instead of just giving information, using our platform to give information, we are now we've now become advocates for social change as an organization. Yeah. So coming back to the question where do you see yourself in five, ten years? Yeah. I don't know really. But uh I just I just hope that uh, we continue to bridge the information gap between young people and uh, the duty bearer that serves them, making sure that every young person in the community, not only just in Bari, like, like I said, we have now expanded to uh, outside Bari. Yeah. We hope to reach as many communities. We also hope to reach the rural communities as well. So our, our hope is that... Uh, we we get to go there and we provide information and all young people can be able to to participate in issues in governance related issues yeah. which affects them they have to be able to make decisions or at least influence decisions to duty bearer so that they they can live the life that they all hope for yeah yeah it's great man i like i said i always enjoy talking to you um it's been four years since we last spoke it has been, uh, yes. I hope we can do this again. <laughs> in, um, I'm always open. In in four years' time, and <laughs> we see where we 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 both are at at that point in time. Um, thank you so much for for giving me your time. Uh, I hope this inspires a few people. Uh, I hope it furthers your journey as much as it will yes. ours. And yeah, that's I guess that's basically it, Richard. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful for you for calling me to to be here as well. It was a really great experience talking about the list going for the journey that we yeah. come across, yes. Okay.